All right, thank you for staying with Daybreak. We're talking about the race to state, our 74 days to go to the elections. Are you seeing a clear agenda? Dennis Ndumbi is still with me here, governance and security expert. Kawive Wambua, deputy CEO in Nuka, Kenya, is still with me. Oliver Kipchumba, advocate of the High Court, is also here. Franklin Mkwanja, executive director, CMD, is joining us live from Mombasa. We'll cross over to him in just a bit. Speaking of agendas, there's one that was posed yesterday, and then there was an immediate reaction. Listen to what the deputy president proposed. Tulifanya pale waitiki Tutaweka sasa hazina maalum Vile tulifanya kule Rift Valley Tukaweka one million acre fund Tutaweka pesa ya serikali Kununua ardhi zote Ambazo ziko hapa pwani Zenye hakuna eh, wale wanaitua absentee landlords Na wale mabwenyenye wengine wenye ardhi Tukitumia compulsory acquisition Ili tuondoe uskota kabisa katika pwani hii Na wapwani wamiliki ardhi yao Tuwapimie na tuwapatie title deed Ndiyo tuondoe uskota katika pwani Na katika Mombasa na sehemu za pwani hapa Juzi nilitaja ya kuma nitaweka eh, Hassan Joho Kama waziri wa, wa mambo ya mashamba Alesi suhu kujua shida ya mashamba ya puwani na Kenya kwa jumla Sasa hiyo unasema ati hiyo Atalele sasa ati hiyo kupand pesa Ataweka Hili ya kununua mashamba Ya kupatia wali umari ambayo hana mashamba Nambia mbari wei kuenda soma historia ya Kenya Kure zuna mwaya kihistoria Mbari wei hulehi Hiyo shida ya mashamba kuni pwani ujaelewa wei ujasoma Kujui Sisi sinajua Kihini ya shida ambaye na kumba wa pwani Sisi na tunajua Atunazuluhu so right after that, ODM leader Raila Odinga had mentioned that that in itself is an avenue of corruption because he questioned that who really owns the pieces of land that then will be bought by the government. Kawiva, what do you make of that proposal? Now, here's a solid proposal of how to deal with something, but then an immediate counter that it is a possible integrity loophole. When, when Kenyans were fighting for independence, the Mau Mau Army was called the Land and Freedom Army. Yeah. And uh, the, the issue that uh, people wanted is Mzungu Arudi, Kwao, our land reverts back to us. Because it was our land. Nobody was landless before the whites came here because they introduced a different uh, land tenure system. But around independence or after independence, we got a loan as the Kenyan uh, government to buy land from white settlers, to buy all those farms. And we got that land, and that land was bought. The question that we need to ask is, and we bought the money, and as Kenyans, we continued paying the loan, which we got from the British to buy land from British settlers and others, all right? We continued paying that money until in the 1990s. But that land, when it was bought, it did not go to citizens. Just a few of them, maybe very uh, minute number, but it went to the people who were in leadership. So saying that you'll get money from government to buy land is not new in itself. It has been done before. But we know the process of uh, how that land is uh, acquired and then therefore disposed and given is, uh, is something that has to, be, uh, has to be managed because we've burned our fingers before. The land buying companies in Kenya, in the Rift Valley and in whatever, were converted to personal uh, property uh, by, by the people who were running, running the base. So it's not, it's not a new thing. And landlessness in Kenya from then until now has never, has never ended. So I think both, both uh, uh, Raila and Ruto are not sincere with this. They have been uh, in government as ministers from, for a long time, and nobody wants to address the, the land question. Look at Taita Taveta, for instance, uh, the, the, the land that, that is there that, uh, you know, and the, president, the deputy president explained, I bought the land. I bought the land as a willing buyer, willing seller kind of thing. That is what was also being done in the 60s and 70s. And the, that does not solve the land problem in, uh, in uh, Taita, Taita Taveta. And that also goes on all, on all sides of the, all the divide. And land is a very explosive uh, topic in this country because uh, when, when it goes to uh, certain levels of leadership, it is the leaders yeah. who have huge swaths of land. And therefore, you cannot discuss how to 
uh, deal with the question of land without involving without involving them and without taking care of their interests. And those interests, yeah. let me tell you, have been put on a wall. They never move from 1963 up to the present. Yeah. yeah. And then, Dennis, is it hypocritical to stand in a place where people themselves are squatters, they don't have land, and yet admit to their faces that I do have 2,500 acres right here, mm. but I got it from criticals because I paid his loan. Mm. Is it even fair? Uh, you know, first of all, allow me to start uh, from the fact that um, the Constitution itself is a socioeconomic construct. Um, you can't ignore critical aspects that the construction of the COK 2010 was based on an economic liberation. And therefore, when you look at uh, Article 43, when you look at Article 10.2, uh, they prescribe the economic liberation, uh, aspects of equity, and name it all the way. There's the whole of that construct. And then look at Chapter 6, which prescribes the mannerisms and the conduct of the person who's supposed to adjudicate that economic liberation. And that's then the political leader and technocrats, and they're about, you see. Um, the deputy president was uh, constructing the TGRC because one of the things that the TGRC prescribed, especially in the coastal areas, was the fact that TGRC indicted colonial and present governments on the failure to prosecute the land question. And the land question in the coastal areas is that you have squatters in their own land. The question of access to land. When you look at the four factors of production, you have land, you have entrepreneurship, uh, you know, I was, I was just looking at them here, you have labor and you have capital. The access to land is a critical question when you're talking about socioeconomic liberation. The fact that Costarians have not been able to access that. You remember there was a story that um, Orengo, when he was the land minister in the coalition government that Kibaki was there, there was a, a big scandal of the fact that uh, they gave themselves over 500,000 acres in the coast area. And that progressed all the way into the Uhuru government, the question of uh, violence and self-help measures. When you look at the question of Mpeketon itself, you know, homegrown terrorism, you know, it is, is boils down to issues of land. Therefore, any government that ignores the question of land in, coast, in the coast area, and in Kenya generally, then you're not being honest about socioeconomic liberation. Because that's one of the critical aspects in terms of factors of production. We, you can't produce when you can't access land. You understand? It's not possible. The greatest issue in TGRC was land. Squatters in their own motherland, at the end of the day. Lack of access of land. Corruption on land issues. The fact that you have uh, politicians in this country that own three quarters of the country, where are the rest of us going to stay? You understand? The biggest thing, Trevor, today that you have to answer as a man, as a father, is ownership to land. You're regarded as a squatter, as a non-starter, somebody who shouldn't even have anywhere to be buried. You have nothing at all. You know, it, 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 it boils worse, even uh, especially if you come from some of our areas there in Mount Kenya. If you have no land, you're regarded as a squatter. Uh, you know, you, it's, it's shameful even for you to keep on visiting your mother's house. So the truth is, the land issue is on the ballot because it's a clear factor of injustice. It's equity. The Constitution, when it prescribes social economic liberation, it puts the land question into play. Yeah. And therefore, one of the things that we have to open is the archived TGRC and just debate it openly. Yeah. You understand, at the end of the day. And I don't think we need to belabor ourselves about uh, deputy, presidents, uh, bu uh, deputy president buying land judiciously. It's not a crime. I mean, then we have to look at how much did you buy, whether it's one acre or whatever it is that there is. That's, that's, that, that is not the important question. The important question is the millions of Kenyans that cannot access land. The millions of Kenyans that cannot produce. You understand? Squatters in their own land. There is enough land in the coast province for everyone. Whether the government is getting this money by itself to settle that question, it is something that we cannot run away from. And that is what Raila Odinga is trying to medicate by giving Joho, Minister of Land. He's trying to show Costarians, look, I am now thinking of you. And then I will give one of you also, yeah. who is, a, you know, by all means, uh, has been in leadership, has been a governor there, but has failed uh, to prosecute the land question. But Trevor, 
we can we can no longer run away okay. uh, from this land question. All right. The issue of squatters in this country is so real and is so perennial that the colonial government and the neo-colonial governments have really forgotten to prosecute it. Okay. And that has been the principle of post-election violence because it's one of the most critical factors yeah. when it comes to socioeconomic economic Okay, keep Jimba. I think it is unfortunate, Trevor, that 63 years after, the, after we got our independence, we still discuss of things like land, people being squatters, and as my friend has said, before colonialism, everybody had land, and we were moving around here without titles. But back to the germane discussion, let us not cheapen this discussion by reducing the land question to a William Ruto ownership land discussion. Mm. Let us keep it at the high table where it's supposed to be. And my plea to Azimio is that when somebody brings a mathematics formula, you don't say that formula doesn't work, you come with another. For us to have a healthy discussion, short of small talks and jibes, we need to get the Azimio's roadmap in terms of land question. Yeah. William Ruto has said we will buy the one million something, we, it is on the table. Let Azimio come and say we will go using this other formula. We will change the land ownership system in this country like the South African way where everybody lives al along the tarmac so that the far-flung areas are used for agriculture to make the country productive. It is happening in Australia. So at the end of the day, we need to have that discussion and genuinely go to the depth of the issue. Yeah. We have not even touched the surface. Yeah. We have not even touched the, the icing of this cake. The question is this, why isn't the new land report implemented to date? Why is it still there? And if we were to ask, William Ruto bought the land on a willing buyer, willing seller. Even if William Ruto was not to buy the land, other people will have bought the land from criticals because it is criticals who are selling his land. Secondly, if we were to go down and ask William Ruto about the land, just in the same Taita Taveta, there is a Kenyan politician who owns 42,000 acres. Whom did they buy it from? Just in the same Taita Taveta, there are ministers who own thousands of land in the Kenyatta administration. Whom do they buy it from? It is very unfair for us to reduce our whole discussion to an individual. We cheapen the discussion. Whereas we have Kenyans living in squalor, yeah. living like rats. We really need to respect those people. And my suggestion is this. This election period will be decided on very many other aspects. Apart from the economy, the land question will decide it maybe at the cost, but what we must pin down our politicians into is what is your answer to this question? Yeah. And my take to politics now is different from how I will have taken it two years by two years before. To Kenyans, this is my plea to you. Make sure that the same way politicians bargain for their interest in coalitions, make sure that every politician fulfills your personal interest. If land is my interest as Kipchumba, I'll vote for the politician who's talking about land. If economy is my interest, vote for that politician. If water is your interest, vote for the gubernatorial politician who is answering your question. Because, Trevor, for the longest time, yeah. we have allowed politicians to play around with us, to juggle us like a ball. Yeah. Let us pin them down on the interests that touch on our daily lives. Okay. That way we will move forward. And back as I finish on the issue of the land question. How we address the land question, from where I sit, it should never be a political issue. Yeah. It should be an issue whereby if there is land, government should buy, we still have the, set the settlement fund. It yeah. has so much money. It is administered, I think, under the ministry, the CS of lands and state house. Why don't we activate that fund to buy land for the landless? Yeah. Do we have, for example, the data of how many people are squatters in this country? Do we have the data of how many people are absentee landlords? And the final point, Trevor, who stopped the issue of the maximum and minimum acreage? 
there is a law that is lying in parliament that talked about maximum and minimum acreage. We should not be asking how much land does William Ruto own. There are people who own Nyanza province in this country. Nobody questions them. And we have been told by my friend Dennis Tumbi, land is a factor of production. When somebody owns more than 500,000 acres, it means they are more likely to be successful than you are. Okay. They are richer than three generations that will be born. Okay. So those are the realities <laughs> we need to face. But, but we, as we're looking for Franklin Mukwanja, who is joining us online. In fact, Franklin is with us now. Franklin, Kipchumba is saying that we shouldn't make this about who owns what piece of land, but even though the, there's a proposal of buying the one million acre fund, isn't it important to find out first who owns this land? How did they get it? Now that we are buying it from them, how did they get it and who even owns the land to begin with? Thank you, Trevor. I, I agree with uh, uh, Karori to the extent that we should not cheapen this conversation. Uh, you realize that in 2010, uh, Kenya's new constitution promised that historical land injustices would be investigated by a new body. Uh, that's the National Land Commission. In 2012, there was a legislation to effect uh, that promise. The deadline for submission of claims uh, passed in September 2021, and I think it's now a good time to reflect on our understanding of historical land injustices. Uh, and, and therefore, it is also clear that it must be an election issue, and we must have clear proposals from the various political formations on how an equal concentration of land in the hands of the wealthy, land grabbing, landlessness, and unresolved historical land injustices uh, must be resolved. And, and I say this because land injustices in this country are sedimented uh, in the political economy. It is not possible to isolate uh, the present and past historical land injustices. And it is also not possible to understand Kenya's political economy separate from an understanding of how the normal and supposedly the abnormal corruption and land grabbing particularly are co-dependent. And, and therefore, we we have to look at historical land injustices uh, that have never been sealed off uh, from apparently uh, properly functioning of politics and economics. Uh, we to, Taking this uh, continuity in a serious uh, manner between the colonial past and the recolonizing practices of the present will enable this country to connect historical and present land injustices. Uh, they are intricately connected. Uh, the land injustice of the past enable and deepen those of the present, uh, structuring the economy, determining who owns what, and deeply affecting uh, class formation. So it is not an issue that you can uh, cheap it. It's not an issue that you can remove off the table, but we must seek the order of truth, who owns what, where and how did they acquire it, what is the justice that uh, those affected uh, require, and, and, and how do we reconcile and, and, and conciliate uh, you know, our communities uh, about land? Otherwise, we will continue having the issue as a motive and adding on ethnicity, adding on the very uh, fairly educated young people uh, without jobs when we rely, when we are an agroeconomy, we are only having sufficient ingredients uh, for problems that cannot be resolved uh, going forward. All right, Kavive is under to respond to this the, issue. The, the land question is yeah. a deep question. And it is so deep because it was the basis of our independence. And it's so deep because of the tenure system that it was introduced. Yeah. And let me tell you, just like uh, uh, the people say that they have acquired land through buying, you will find very few people who acquired land through and, and uh, ways that they have not regularized. Yeah. Whether, whether they acquired, but they have regularized. They have tried to deeds, yeah. and they'll say, this is my property, and they have a right to it. Now, that is where the problem begins. Because, like I told you, when we, we got the loan in 1963, we bought land as, as a country. We bought land from white settlers. Just forget about that being a, a, a difficult conversation first, yeah. because they had not bought it anyway. So when we bought that land, it did not go to the people. Yeah. It went to uh, them, uh, and they have titles and they have evidence that they bought and some of them have subdivided and sold. Yeah. And therefore, it's a, it's a huge question. These people who are absentee landlords in the coast, you'll find them with title deeds. You'll find them, they have a process, a way in which they acquired this land. They, they, there is documentation. And that is why 
the digitalization of the Ministry of uh, Lands Records has taken so long because it is a huge thing to, uh, to deal with. So I think as these elections, what we should have our baseline is the Ndungu report. Yeah. Let it be implemented. I think that, that should be what we demand of on the land question. Okay. Because the Dungu report was very exhaustive <coughs> and it looked at the historical things of including people being ferried from areas in, uh, in uh, Mount Kenya and carried in lorries to the coastal region and being settled in certain areas and to the Rift Valley and others and by legitimate land buying companies. So that when you, you, you find them, they have legitimate titles. But what happens to uh, the people of Taitavera, for instance, whose land was owned by criticals and that other politician uh, Kipchumba is uh, mentioning. And therefore, they, they, they can't buy it, they can't access it, yeah. uh, but it is their motherland, their grandfathers are buried there, but it has been bought, and therefore they don't have access to it. What do you do to those people? Do you put them in a lorry and you take them to Mandera? You know, those are the questions that we need to ask as a country. Yeah. And those questions <coughs> are, not, are not cheap, and they are not, uh, uh, they, they should be, uh, we should, at the political level, deal with the principle of how do we deal with the land question. But uh, not prescribe now, because already there is a lot, there is a lot of thinking that has been uh, done into it. We cannot start a new thinking without implementing and seeing what's wrong with it, yeah. with the Dongo report, with the TJRC report, with all those reports that have documented uh, purposed disenfranchisement of citizens mm. from their land and from their access to land and means of production. Yeah, mm. Dennis, you wanted to jump yes. into this because my yes. concern is even as we were buying the land from the colonialists, they didn't buy that land. Mm. That's my question right there. So if uh, if you take my laptop right now and then I get come and land. buy it from you and yet you didn't buy it. He bought it from <laughs> Grogan. That makes sense? Yes. <laughs> there was Grogan. There was Grogan in Taita. <laughs> there was uh, Criticos. Uh, there were all these people. At the, at the first instance, yeah. you know what colonialists used to do? They used to come here and say, uh, from where you are seated up to there, that is my That's land. That's my land. Mm. Then we come and buy So, you know, uh, you know, Trevor, the question on land in this country is a very sensitive matter because there's no independence without land. And at independence, what we regained back, which was ours, it meant that the population that was there of our forefathers then, yeah. all of them deserved to have a piece of land. My grandfather fought for the independence and when they came from the bush, there wasn't any land. And you're talking about freedom fighters. There was no land. In fact, my grandfather inherited land, land from my grandmother's side. Many of the Mau Mau fighters never got any land. It was grabbed, it had gone, you understand? But this is a justice question. This is a human rights issue because there has been a systemic marginalization and alienation. You understand? And any government that wouldn't discuss the land question is indeed what you're calling hypocrisy, but the suppression of the land question is unfortunate. And the Jubilee government did not have the moral authority to prosecute the land question. Why? You know, because Uhuru Kenyatta himself is regarded as one of the greatest aggressors towards land question, if we're talking about honesty. And that's the reason why Raila Odinga is morphing. You understand? Because he doesn't know, should I prosecute this question or should I not prosecute this question? Because if you go to course and you ask anybody about uh, whether Jubilee and uh, the Uhuru administration had any moral and, uh, moral and ethical authority to discuss about the land question, they, they, they don't have it. Because they sit and, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the perception is that they are the greatest aggressors when it comes to the land question. But that notwithstanding, I think where we sit today, we have an opportunity to reclaim that. We have an opportunity to give dignity back to our Kenyans. We have a healthy constitution that is prescriptive, that is built on uh, the foundations of the TGRC. TGRC gives a remedy, and it's not a bandage remedy. It is not about, you know, the problem with this country is that politicians do citations, but implementation is zero. You understand? Okay, you know, so let's talk about the coalition government. What was the issue? You remember that time there was a secession. There was incredible secession. Pwan is your Kenya, what not. Raila Odinga got half of the government, another one half of the government. The, the, the ministry they asked for was the Ministry of Lands. Look at what happened. 70% of the arable land in Lamu was put in question. 500,000 acres, Orengo himself has never answered today. You understand? So the problem is that politicians come into power, 
and they use that force to aggrieve more. You understand? The question of suppression on the land question is one of the things that Kenyans have never realized their independence so far. Independence is maybe on 10 or 15 or 20 people in the country. But the rest of us, as long as we don't have access to land, yeah. and even those ones who have access to land, if they don't have access to capital, and if they don't have access to entrepreneurial environment, you understand? Today, a farmer in Moranga, even if he has land, he can't uh, uh, do his dairy cows properly because policy in itself suspends what we call the market economy, uh, market democracy. So in this country, we have a good document that prescribes democracy and liberation in land, yeah. in access to capital, in entrepreneurship, and in labor. We, the men and the women in this country, need to be healthy enough to work, mental health, whatever it is that you are. But those things have been suspended and suppressed by one government after another government. Yeah. And that's the reason why I am loving what uh, Deputy President is doing in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, activating the economic charters. When you sit in one, you, you'll, you'll ask yourself, have we been in a country that have been, has been functional? You know, the reality hits you so hard and you're like, goodness, it's almost like we haven't done anything. It's like we have come from a reset. Is that COVID questioned every system and every ideology that we had and it exposed the hypocrisy yeah. that nothing has been executed that is judicious enough to offer that liberation. Okay. And frankly enough, what I pray is that other than discussing the bottom-up economic model, we need to see the implementation of that, and it has to be done. You understand? The UDA administration, when it comes to power, one of the things that will be critical is to have a healthy parliament, a healthy senate, healthy county governments, yeah. that then make sure that the checks and balances yeah. of implementing the bottom-up okay. economic model I, and the economic charters, yeah. the acquisition of it, have a is prudent. Reba, but let's, let's see, I, Reba, I think it's, uh, it's unfortunate yeah. that I'm realizing that the gentleman here hold brief for UD. <laughs> <laughs> don't hold brief. But what is UD that we're that discussing about, brother? brother? But the issue no, is, no, no. Let's, yeah. let's move. That's what we're saying. Let's not politicize this. Let's move the issues back to the citizens, the citizen quest. And what we are saying is, and Kipchumba said, let us vote for uh, politicians who speak to our issues. Yes. But I'll tell you that in 2013, Ruto and Uhuru spoke to the issues that they wanted. They talked about computers. They talked about dams. They talked about reformation in this country. So when Kenyans voted for them, yeah, whether or not it was a contest, whether or not they were the ones who won, but they became the Nini, what is the report or where is the report on the achievement of those goals that we set? How many stadiums have been, uh, have been created? How many children received laptops? In fact, there's a joke that goes around that says that, uh, you know, the, the children who are promised laptops now are coming, are coming to vote. And we are saying it is true. The, 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 and this political space, whether it is Uda, it is Azimio, or it is who, politicians will go out there, they do research. They have a lot of money to do research. They do research and say, what are the issues that resonate with people here? Yeah. So how do we pitch our campaign? And therefore, they pitch their campaign, and people are like, yes, these are our people. But that is the end of the story. Okay. So as Kenyans, we must also be, be, be aware that the promises that are being given by these politicians, yeah. if there's no mechanism of holding them to account, they will not be done. And we have seen... Card. That is what I agreed with you, no, brother. We have Correct. seen that people making those, <laughs> those, uh, those promises are not keeping them. Okay. So are we, are we Kenyans going to, to live in a, in a jamboree where we are being taken round and round and being and promised? To every no! Time. Keep Jumba, you wanted to respond to this. Uh, I think Trevor... An old brief for Kenyans. <laughs> the, greatest, no, the greatest problem we suffer from yes. is uh, we mix issues every often. Yeah. We were discussing a very good discussion about land, about the plight of squatters, how political sides came into it. I, I don't even understand. Is where the problem is. Yeah. Number two. Not a problem. Yeah. Number two. <laughs> I think as Kenyans, yeah. we must continually <laughs> shake the system, yeah. ask the hard questions. Yes. Because if there are promises that were not met in 2013, why did we elect these people in 2017? And there was an election. It's not like we, we, were, we gave them a free ride. So everybody must carry their part of the blame that you are given a role to play as opposition. How far did you play?
you are given to a role to play as the government of the day. How did you implement it? Yeah. Those questions, if answered, we will move forward. Number two, there is a point I've always pushed for. I might not have I might not have the enough political muscle to push for it, but this country will make progress when once we go the Nigerian way, where we have a panel of around nine or eight people who vet some of these presidential candidates. Because you cannot live in a country where we live from promise to promise and those promises go unanswered. It is in law we say the description must fit the product. So if politicians describe a future which they do not uh, achieve it within their term, we go, we send them home. Yeah. Because we are not, and there is something that I want to add Kenya 74 days to the election. Let us not vote with our hearts. Let us vote with our minds. Okay. Romance and politics, the difference is one. Romance goes to the heart. Politics should go to the mind. Okay. That what am I getting out of this? Okay. It is not like this thing, oh, they love me, they love me. No, what am I getting out of this? Okay. <laughs> You've seen how Kalonzo is shuffling in this uh, <laughs> coalition from one end to another to even being our own candidate. It is because they are beginning for themselves. Why don't Kenyans do that? 50 shillings of Gonya or Ritiakta in my place, we say it so, is not enough. We need to bargain for more. If somebody is going to loot a whole 10 billion, let them pay us more. Okay. Because we are tired of this thing. We are going in circles. Mm. Okay, okay. Trevor. interesting. Because let me bring in Mukwanda. Mukwanda has been quiet for a while. But 30 yes. seconds. We have to move from uh, the political chips Funga generation, <laughs> the Tumafea generation, <laughs> yeah. to practice Article 1 of the Constitution. That's a constituent power of the Manainchi. We have to understand that we are the employers at the end of the day. And let me say this, where we have to put more weight is on the implementation of all promises. Kenyans vote and they go home. We have to vote and go into parliament, into the executive, into the judiciary, yeah. into all arms of government together with these people and consistently hold them yeah. accountable of the resources of everything. So that's not a footer. You know, at the end of the day, we want that dignity of providing for our families, of accessing medical care, of uh, having the dignity to uh, the aspects and the actors of production. You understand? So we have to move away from this madness. Yeah. It's not about, uh, and that's the reason why I say it, and this is not political. I am loving the economic charters and you should sit in one. The truth is that you, you, you realize a lot of flaws that we have been operating in a wrong platform. Yeah. from then and i pray that the next parliament should legislate the economic charters because it's a powerful concept yeah. that we need to drive into policy and into law okay yeah very I, briefly because i want to bring in i, I think very, very briefly <laughs> yeah. is like i think they're very good proposals but honestly as a country yeah. we are under siege why you say we are chips funga as as citizens we are under siege <laughs> why constitution we have it is not being implemented yeah if you look at the clause where you are supposed to recall leaders parliament was supposed to do a law what did they do they did a law that you cannot recall you cannot use that law to recall any politician That's so what what, what, it, what it is harder power? to recall a politician yeah. than yeah. to wait what, for one to die what constitution power do they have you when, when you say when you say when you say that we, we need to to bargain where is the space yeah the space at the ballot. we need, we need to to bargain at the space of integrity. What did parliament do in, in 2010 so that they passed the constitution and every Kenyan said, let's get it. Parliament introduced a clause in 73 2, which says being elected in a free and fair election is like uh, having integrity. You know, you know, Trevor, in this country, the moment that we understand that we are under siege of the political class and that our, our collective sovereignty, the Article 1 sovereignty, as is almost being given lip service. The moment we realize that, then as a country we can make a, a decision on how we want to process. Yeah. But I think first and foremost from, from these elections, let's start with the question of integrity in leadership. Yeah. And then we can now have a discussion. All right. Mkwanja, and let me bring in on this conversation. Let's talk about that actually, the chapter six of the constitution, which is on integrity. How then do we sift through the leaders and measure in terms of the electorate that this is a person who is fit for this position? Because I've, I've seen some of the leaders who have tainted here and there, but people still say that even back in the day we elected people who had cases, so it's a free for all. Yeah, thank you. It's a very critical question, and uh, the leaders that uh, Kenyans choose are a reflection 
of who Kenyans are. And therefore, the Kenyans are, the ballot is not um, limited to only the crooks that Kenyans uh, largely elect. That tells you the mentality uh, of, of the voter. So even before we begin looking at the the leaders that we have, we must ask ourselves, are the people that make choices really find themselves so choiceless that they only end up with uh, the leaders that we have? Um, I think I would encourage that we need to have an increased higher level of our partisan voters, voters who tend to be more reliant on their own judgment uh, rather than a party to determine how to cast their votes. Uh, because if you look at uh, political parties that are blatantly giving their tickets to people that have been impeached, uh, they have gone to the High Court, they have gone to the Court of Appeal, and these have been uh, restrained, uh, have, have been uh, retained as, 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 as clear decisions, why then give those tickets? And, and, and I think that is a Kenyan responsibility, that we have to improve our civic competence to make right choices, to make uh, to be reliant on our own judgment that fits into our our ethos, our yeah. values, and then we will be able to get leaders uh, that reflect the society uh, that we want. On a broader level, I think we need to look at how do we make sure that we design elections uh, that do not just uh, defeat uh, the criteria of democracy. Uh, basically, having regular, uh, fussy uh, electoral process. Uh, to check the boxes and not critically looking at how does electoral democracy uh, contribute to our economic development, our unity, our cohesion as a country. Uh, the idea of having elections um, as a to, so that we keep diplomatic respectability uh, that elections confer on our state is, I, I think, is, is something that we must run away from Kenyans. It's a, a bigger, broader conversation uh, that, that we must uh, continually look at because, as I say, uh, relevance, uh, popularity and influence of political parties is on the decrease. Uh, are the independent candidates that we are seeing mushrooming, are they any different from the candidates uh, that are in the political parties? Are the independent candidates saying something uh, that the political parties that are available as uh, a menu for us to choose from, yeah. missing some particular aspects that we must look at. So this is a collective process that we must look at, beginning with the civic competence of, of the people who make choices, because I don't believe we are very much choiceless on the ballot. Yeah. Uh, they, they are not two presidential candidates. It's not a two-horse race, for instance. Uh, there's Ruben Kigame on that. There's Professor Wajakoya on that ballot. Are we not giving them opportunity and chance to see what they can be able to do? Okay. <laughs> That's interesting. No, but, uh, interesting options. But, uh, that Trevor, yeah. <laughs> there is something we need to discuss. And we go back to the media and uh, whatever you are trying to do. We have uh, 55 presidential candidates. In those 55 presidential candidates... 11 of them were not cleared, so there are about 40. 60, Let, let's even say 30. For them to be cleared. Let's say even 30. We have women there running for president. We have w women there who have been nominated as running, but women of sterling performance, women of character and other things. But how we reduce this to a two-horse race and make the others rats and rabbits is what uh, my brother is saying we are under siege. And uh, my good friend Dennis Tumbi is saying it's a chips funga kind of politics. Because at the end of the day, what Kenyans should never lack is options. That is what we, we are. We can run out of everything, but we are not allowed to run out of options. So that we have allowed Kenyans to be cornered by two individuals, it is not the right way to go. And that's why we are saying we cannot just be taking prescriptions from the two people. The media should explore others. We should ask Wajakoya, for example, outside talking about marijuana, what are you offering Kenyans? <laughs> We should ask about all this. We should ask my friend uh, Jeremiah Kukubo. What are you offering apart from being the, mo the man who has run the presidency for the longest? We should ask Kigame, what are you offering apart from the integrity issue? Because also we need to be practical. Yeah. At the end of the day, and we can talk about it here. You can go to Modaiga Golf Club and talk about it. You can go to Karen. You can go to Eldoret Club and talk about it. But the integrity question doesn't pick in a political season. That is the question we need to ask. Why? 
because all these things have been reduced to just here gossip there yeah. this one reply to that one there's a cartoon about this politician but the germane issues yeah. are not coming to the fore okay. and that is when kenyans get a raw deal look at even when we talk about independent candidates most of them are hypocrites most of them are mediocre people you lose an election in a party and go to an, to stand as an independent no that is not what the framers of the constitution talked about yeah. Trevor because the framers of the constitution thought or had in mind that for Kipchumba to be an independent candidate for example yeah. I must have read through the 84 political parties the, what they stand for and found that none of them share my vision for the people it is not that that was a remit for people who lose election or who are rigged out to get their way to the ballot. No, it was for people with unique ideas yeah. to get their self into the ballot. So when we turn to independence, for example, and say they are the people who will save us, it is a lie. Okay. These are just the same scavengers looking for dead meat elsewhere. Okay. They and are not and Kawiwe, this is an important thing that Oliver is raising, that how come the integrity issue is not a main concern? You tried it, but the Inuka Kenya was part of the team that did the red card for the uh, uh, all politicians who were tainted in one way or another. But there was a very quick rejoinder. Everyone is innocent until proven guilty. <laughs> yeah, so how come this no, integrity concern we, we did is not, not a big deal? We did not try it. It is the mainstay of our campaign. It's ongoing. Yeah. We are building on the list. Very soon we are going to uh, give a more, a, a more detailed list with uh, more names. And we are, we are saying to Kenyans, Please use these indices because you are using public indices saying this person has been summoned by DCI to do it is in record. This person is in court. This person has been uh, uh, said is being investigated for ABCD. So we and that is like the, the lowest the lowest level that we can use because then we have not interrogated the character of persons in it. So we are, we are just trying to use an objective criteria to do it. And we would like Kenyans to speak to the red card and pick up the red card. Because at the political level, like you said, there is already a rejoinder. And uh, you know this is through another unfortunate clause, which was inserted by parliament in 2010, the 99-3 clause, that you have to exhaust every a possible avenue possible avenue it is there in the constitution and that's what they are using it yeah. but it is it is wrong the spirit of the constitution was uh, about integrity is that people who have tainted uh, 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 who are involved character. in, in uh, attended character or are involved in things that are dubious should not be allowed in your village even if you know a family, a family uh, has got, uh, the people in that family tend to have very uh, sticky fingers, they steal. It's very hard for people in that village to employ anybody from that family to guard their home. Why? And no, nobody says, but everybody says, mm -mm. those I'm ones, no, I can't know how. Yeah. Why? It is the integrity question that we ask. Why can't we ask the same of our leaders? Why do we get somebody who is being investigated and who has been said to do ABCD to become the leader? Because like Chimbuba says, Kipchumba says they, have, they can convince us or they are able to, to, to you know, project themselves very well. Yeah. The reason why integrity does not work in this country is because people acquire money by all means. Yeah. To go because in the elections you need money and therefore the question of methods become a means to accessing political power and when you get political power yeah. then it is difficult to to reverse it because you are in the seat yeah. right now there is a case of a politician in the coastal region whose case of a suspected murder and of um, of suspected corruption has been stopped and the the, the 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 court says until after the elections so you sit down and wonder what if they are elected what if they are elected? Nothing is, you know, that those cases will die a natural death. Okay. Why? Yeah. Trevor, if you have a case, if you have a case, you have a case, you or me have a case of uh, suspected murder or corruption, that the hearings will go on every week. Okay. Until Trevor, you are convicted. Bring just, it just there's yeah. something that yeah. must be corrected. Whereas we agree that uh, our leaders must be of integrity and above board, yeah. we must also make sure that we ring fence and protect our human rights. The article talking about you must have exhausted all your chances of appeal yeah. is there not to protect the politicians but to protect Kenyans because when you are making a constitution you make a constitution knowing actually to be very fair the constitution is made to protect us from the state 
we know under the contracts, the social contract, we yeah. gave our authority to the to something, the animal known as state. We protect ourselves from it because of so much power. Okay. So if today, look at what has been happening in a few couple, in the few years, post handshake, people have been arraigned in court through a politically instigated process. Kemsa thieves are still walking around. They are campaigning in Azimio. We know them, we see them. So if we were to take that to be the main yardstick for integrity, we will lose the plot. Okay. But if we do not, if that now is cured by the fact that we have the article in the constitution that says, number one, you are innocent till proven guilty. Number two, you cannot be denied a chance to run until you have exhausted your appeals. This one protects against when institutions are yeah. weaponized to achieve political gain. Okay. And you, going to the future. No, that's on the point of going to the future. That's one point. One small going to the future. One going to the future. Yeah. The law. Social institutions yes. should be funded to fight corruption okay. and integrity. That's fund the ACC. Right. Fund the CI. Yeah. Make DPP independent. Okay. Corruption will be fought. And it is in our interest yes. to fight corruption. Okay, let's bring that in. Trevor, yeah. uh, the unfortunate thing in this country is that uh, we have the what I call the Wamlambe's economy. <laughs> <laughs> where condoms are being consumed. And I, I, I was in the interest, we have to follow, who is this, who is using these condoms? Why do you need so many? Millions of them, you're selling them to take them where? But the unfortunate factor is that we have failed, on the, because integrity is a, is a concept of building believability in yeah. that government. You understand? Building an infrastructure that there'll be trust in government. You understand at the end of the day. But we have guidelines both for the voter and for the one who's going to come in because chapter six of the constitution doesn't just speak into the politician, it speaks into the electorate that this is the kind of person that you need to vote for. But Trevor, unfortunately, integrity in this country has been weaponized. And the report that they offered was a good report, but at the end of the day, it failed the integrity test in one measure. <laughs> Why did it fail the integrity test? Because many of the issues that they have put there are issues of weaponized politics at yeah. the end of the day. And I think what the opportunity that they have, and it's a good progression, I'm not saying it's not, the good progression is ensuring that we, we strengthen and call out institutions that are supposed to fight graft. The criminal justice system is highly compromised. We have actually established the greatest economy in Kenya, Trevor, you know is which one? The bail and bond economy. You understand? That you can arrest a politician or a, or a, or a governor yeah. who has tagged billions of shillings and then you harvest from them a bit of those billions, you understand? And then it's okay, you know, we move on at the end of the day. So the bail and bond economy is so huge that we're not interested in prosecuting and building integrity, we are interested in sharing that cake out of corruption. You understand at the end of the day. However, and I go back to the greatest organ that we can supply strength to is the Mwananchi, is the Mamamboga. Yeah. If Mamamboga can be able to transact that money, the danger of government bureaucracy, we saw it during COVID, Masks disappeared. COVID billionaires. Billion, so, today, there's a guy who is in Runda just because he's a thug out of the COVID, uh, COVID billionaires at the end of the day. But if we're able to demolish state bureaucracy from the financial aspect yeah. and ensure that we look at the bottom of the pyramid and supply funds there to circles, to whatever it is that there is. <coughs> the reason why Gekomba is Gekomba. Gekomba is a Kikuyu name that means I will borrow little. Yeah. To build more. You understand? Equity Bank, uh, I'm sure they open at about four in the morning there. And you go in there and you borrow small money and by at midday you have made uh, your money back and you do that. So that aspect of ensuring that we kill, number one, state bureaucracy. You understand? And the money touches the bottom of the pyramid, mm -hmm. you understand, without being controlled by a few, yeah. is indeed one of the best concepts that we can make sure that we kill corruption at the end of the day. Okay. Because corruption is ensuring that money the decisions about finances are made by a few, then what we do is that we upset and negate Article 1 of the Constitution. Yeah. Because there's no power without funds. Okay. You understand? We can, And that's what my brother was saying. If we keep on talking, 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 the poor man's wisdom is not respected in the gates of the city. You understand? At the end of the day. Yeah. 
So if Mama Mboga keeps on being poor, if poverty is entrenched against her, she will have no voice. Okay. But if Mama Mboga today can open a kiosk, tomorrow can open a supermarket, so you yeah. understand? So yes. that is something that we need. Yes, Mkwanja, sure Franklin. Contribute. Franklin, yes, go ahead. I, I think next time, yes, I think next time I'll have to come in person in the studio because this gentleman <laughs> is very good at, that is the at speaking continuously. Uh, <laughs> yes, go yes. ahead. So, so I, I think... A political integrity yeah. means exercising political power consistently in the public interest. This must be independent from private interests and not using power to maintain the office holders' own wealth and, and, and position. And this is what we clearly see playing it out. And, and we must also underscore that understandings of public interest are ever evolving and at times uh, hotly debated like uh, what I'm seeing today in the studio. But what is clear is that political integrity is only possible when safeguards exist throughout uh, the political process. We have to begin at the process of uh, electing, appointing or selecting those who hold power, making sure that that is free from the undue influence of vested interests. Uh, are, we, are we clear from that? I think we can see clearly uh, the, the levels of elections preparedness, uh, the lethargic way that the executive has acted uh, towards uh, supporting IBC. Uh, you can see clearly that there are still undue influence of vested interests in, in these processes. Yeah. Uh, secondly, is that stakeholders must have an inclusive, open, and meaningful opportunities uh, to equally influence decision making. And, and I think still money has a lot of influence uh, in our politics. The poorer you are, uh, the less opportunities you're going to, to, uh, to have an opportunity uh, to be elected and, and have your ideas on the table. Yeah. And thirdly, that political decisions and power holders uh, must be subject to scrutiny uh, by the public and institutional checks and first consequences for using power uh, for private gain. Impunity continuously uh, defines, uh, you know, our culture. Yeah. Uh, there is no one who's been held accountable, just including on the basic uh, issues like voter bribery uh, and, 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 and the political uh, code of conduct, political parties code of conduct, electoral code of conduct. And, and unless we go deeper and address these basics, unless we realize that our country's problem is not largely uh, the lack of peace, uh, but the absence of common decency, uh, the poor political culture. All these things we are discussing will not have a strong foundation to build on from. Thank you very much, and I rest my question. All right. Uh, Kawibe, are we, uh, are the leaders simply a reflection of who we are? I would, I, I would, I would uh, refrain a lot from mm -hmm. gaslighting Kenyans. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you say it's Kenyans who have a problem. I don't think so. Uh, you cannot condemn a whole population just because uh, they elect or people with the, uh, integrity questions get elected. No, let's not gaslight. Let's not blame Kenyans for the heels of the leadership. I think let's just focus on, on where, on where uh, the things are. Mm -hmm. And my brother, I think I will uh, give you the report that you read. Yeah. Because when you, read. Said, when you say it failed the test of integrity, uh, well, that's good sounding, but I don't think you've you've interacted with the, the questions. Uh -huh. And the questions in it are the questions in it are, are very simple. Has this person been in the last five years? We've used the frame of the last five years. Has this person been? Is it being investigated for something? Is this person uh, in court? Do they have a case? And we are, I agree with Aaron that 99 talks about protecting protecting you know, people to not to be condemned when they have an opportunity to redeem themselves. But that is uh, where I disagree with him is when he says it's, it's about rights. No, it's about leaders. Because that article is under the title of representation of leaders and who can qualify to be a leader. The questions of rights and uh, administration of justice and fair hearings and all that are found in Article 47 through to Article 50 of the Constitution, which talks about citizens and everybody. Access to justice, can you access the courts, can you get fair administrative action? That is where that is found. That's the, the, the rights question. This is a leadership question. And that article, and I have said and I'll repeat, was inserted yeah. by politicians because, honestly, you can't beat that. If we go by the, uh, until you are proven guilty, we will never... We will never end anywhere. And that is why, even today, yeah. the, the questions of uh, 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 2013, which were, were about the, the ICC indictment, that question has gone away. Why? Nobody can prove that either uh, Uhuru or Ruto had uh, 
you know, greatest responsibility in these things. Why? Yeah. The, the mechanism for proving that has, uh, has got so many loopholes and the witnesses disappeared and all yeah. that. Does it mean that if I have been taken to court for, for a crime and it, the, the process is not finished, yeah. that does mean I'm guilty or I'm not guilty. No, it is either, either of those two things. And we are saying, if you have that process, please don't burden us with you coming to say you want to be a leader. Yeah. Can you deal with that issue first? But what if there are false accusations? If there are false you accusations, know, then there should be a, a process yeah. of reparations. Yeah. Trevor. Because if you accuse me falsely and I suffer for 10 years, there should be a mechanism of the court ensuring that I get okay. to be compensated for it. Okay. Trevor. Keep tuned by then I'll come to Dennis. Yeah. There is something uh, my friend is saying that is wrong. Yeah. You have asked a question that uh, are Kenyans to blame. The answer is yes, because... You can't gaslight Kenyans. We are not gaslighting Kenyans, my brother. Look at it here. How many politicians do we have in this country? Not more than 4,000. But on a day-to-day -day basis, if you are to stand from Nairobi here to Rongata, Rongai, Kenyans are paying bribes to policemen. Are those politicians? Those are normal Kenyans. So if you pick one of them to come to the table, they'll continue with what they have been doing to police. There you are remember? The people who, if you were to meet them there, they'll say, Toa Kitu. Are those politicians you meet daily, Trevor? No, they are Kenyans. So we cannot aspire for a higher ideal from our leaders than the one we have at the common average. Do you the remember? average of our integrity is what we bring to the higher table. Yeah. The only difference now between Kenyans and their leaders is that the Kenyan politician is at the table where there is light. <laughs> the Kenyan, the full 50 million who we pay bribes, they are 50 50. <laughs> we are doing it, but nobody is lighting <laughs> on us. So, at the end of the day, I will ask the, this institution yeah. in Inuka or Inua, Inuka Kenya, Inuka Kenya yes. that let us have an honest conversation. You know, it is all about, it, well, corruption in this country is the hag and the hen thing. You don't know which one came first. But if we must get ahead from here, and you must appreciate my brother, that each comma, each sentence in our constitution represents our dark history. When we say it, you must have exhausted all your whatever. We knew that there will come a leader like the Moi or the dark regimes where we could use or we can use politics to harm people. Look at what was done to Sonko. I, I have a lot of issues with Sonko, but from where I sit, his human rights were never respected. He, he, even when he was being removed from office, look at what happened to Waititu. Is that the way we want to go? We cannot fight corruption through corrupt means. We must use the law and the law alone. Okay, Dennis. Yeah. For my brother here, you know, uh, it's important for him to allow public participation. And what we're doing is that we're doing a public edit of uh, the document. It's, it's, it's constitutional, you see. We are implementing, implementing the constitution. Which document? A public, the, the report oh, that you the issued. Report. Okay, okay. A, a report that you issued in public is subject to scrutiny and yes. is subject to being edited I agree. by the yeah. I agree. And I said it's, it's a good process. But one of the things that it, it, uh, it violates is to prosecute the justice system. Yeah. And also it upsets subjudice. Matters before the court then are sensitive to discuss. But you know what happens? It, 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 it's a straight jacket vindication for even cases that have never, haven't been heard. You understand? I saw some cases there. They have not been heard. There's no determination. You understand? So therefore, you have to be careful uh, whether you're offering uh, advice to the public or you're then prosecuting this person further yeah. and sentencing them, and yet you're not a judge. And I think that process is good. I support it. What I'm saying is that let us also interrogate both sides, you know, at the end of the day. Now, I'm there's, happy a, for the support. Yeah, there's a critical thing. I am for it 100%, and I love to be involved, okay. by the way, yeah. because I operate in the criminal justice system. I don't believe in succeeding thugs. Now, there is no <laughs> Kenyan in their right mind uh, who would want to vote a politician who will take them to the grave who will steal their condoms, steal their medicine, you understand? Uh, send them into poverty. And whenever Kenyans, and Kenyans are very trusting, maybe that is their fault, yeah. you understand, at the end of the day. And they have found safety nets in tribes, rather than in democracy. But also, one of the things that our constitution fails to deliver is a protest vote. How do you deliver democracy to a generation that has been raped, ravaged, 
that has been killed systematically, that have been robbed, you understand? There's developed democracy appreciate what it is that we call the protest vote. You understand? Yeah. The protest vote is simple, and this is how they deliver the protest vote in Kenya. They are so upset about a professor, about a doctor, about somebody who has gone to all schools there about my lax ethics are stolen from them. And they'll give you a sonko. They'll give you a white tito. You understand? It's punishment to them. They are telling you we are so upset. Even if a wato comes from the forest, we'll give him the presidency. You understand? But in doing that, then they offend themselves also. You understand? So one of the things we need to do is that we need to see how do we expand elections not to be a straight jacket affair where you only vote if you agree, but then your options are not represented there about. Also the concept of public participation. Yeah. You understand? Democracy, intra-democracy. You understand? Political parties, you know, they give you what they give you. You either need to vote or you need to vote. But then the progression and the succession yeah. of the independent candidate then shows us that the question of inclusivity and democracy in political parties is still a progression that we need to do. And I think uh, if you look at uh, the review on the Political Parties Act, uh, possibly it's never been done from 20, 2011. Yeah. Yet this is the articulate DNA that our democracy is supposed to deliver. So what I'm saying is that we need to expand the, the base of democracy in the country to make sure that everyone participates, that their protest is also <coughs> recognized as a right. Yeah. You understand? I have a right not to vote, but can democracy recognize that the reason why I don't want to vote is because my choices are not there. My ideals are not represented. Yeah. And I'm wounded. You know, my relative or somebody else died out of COVID and there was a solution there about oxygen was a cost of a brand new uh, uh, Range Rover Vela, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> yet we breathe it freely. So the aspect of a community that has been systemically wounded, yeah. them in participating in democracy, that is an option that needs to be, uh, to be offered on the table. Okay. But there is no Kenyan in their right mind who would vote in. Uh, today we have narcocracy. We have people that uh, many other governments have vindicated in terms, in terms of drug deals, and yet they have established their own democracy, yeah. their own systems of fathering, okay. uh, you, know, you, you, know, you know, their success yeah. and, and hurting others. So I think there's need for us to look at it retrogressively. Yeah. And because I believe that uh, democracy is progressive, where, what, what is that progression in the country? Are we at 10%? What is the reality? Are we at 15%? And what is that that is offending that progression? Okay. It's something that but, we but need Gawive, to audit. Gawive, how are you excusing all Kenyans from this without taking collective responsibility? You know, even right now as we speak, the campaign, official campaign period is yet to begin. It's supposed to start on the 29th of May. Yes. Do we see people out there? Who are those people attending the rallies? The interior minister himself said more than 40% of money launderers and criminals will be elected to parliament. How then do we vindicate Kenyans who are the people with the power you know, to vote? It's unfortunate to have uh, government officers say that because they should have those people behind bars. In the first, they can't be have, the whistleblowers. We should have the 40% behind bars. Yes. When the, the biggest problem Goodness we have with me. this country yeah. is when the president said we lose two billion uh, in a Every day. day. But what do you expect? 700 you billion know, a year. You know, when somebody says, what do you expect me to do? Him and Ruto should have resigned because they are not able to prevent Kenyans from losing two billion in a day. If you are not able to do your work, if you are not able to run this program, why would citizens retain you? And the question, the question of Kenyans and gaslighting, and that's why I don't agree with my brothers here, yeah. is that look at what Kenyans are, have gone through. Today, everybody who wakes up, wakes up to joblessness, wakes up to high cost of living, wakes up to prices going through the roof in three months. The price of gas, ilum to gindogo ya gas, has gone from uh, 800 to now it's about 1700. In less than three months, we wake up every day and prices are changing. So when people are struggling with food on the table, what other time, to, on the question of putting food on the table, what other time do they have to in, interrogate the questions of integrity? And then secondly, there are government institutions that are, by uh, the nature of their work, required to provide civic education, voter education, and, to, uh, to, uh, and commissions that are supposed to uh, uh, watch the backs of Kenyans. They are not doing their work. So if today I, I take you to an arrow root, uh, arrow root uh, patch, yeah. and I tell you to, to, uh, you know, to weed that area, yeah. if you do not know how to weed arrow roots, 
let me tell you, you will be a failure. And that's the thing with Kenyans. We do not have uh, uh, the government investing in civic education. We do not have process. Even the government wrote to donors that they should not support uh, any election-related activities. Basically say Kenyans are on their own. Mm -hmm. So you cannot sit there and say Kenyans are wrong. Remember, remember in 2003, uh, Trevor, that Kenyans were arresting policemen who were picking bribes. Kenyans in Matatus. Yes. What happened? What happened was that the whole system just collapsed around Kenyans. People, people started, you know, if you, if you uh, do that, you don't get any support. The moral support from government systems and government infrastructures mm -hmm. is not there yeah. to enable Kenyans to do that. So, whereas, uh, and therefore, the, the question about even most young people not voting is just because it's, uh, it, it's, it does not add value to what they are, they are seeing. They are seeing their parents as failures. They are seeing their parents having been involved in these cyclic elections every five years yeah. and getting nothing out of it. So they are saying, uh, when IBC was asking the questions, they were told, I mean, what is in it uh, after I vote? Uh -huh, therefore, what, what is it? And that's why they are not interested. Yeah. And that's, there must be a way in which we engage as a, as a country and seek to unite Kenyans around issues and if we unite them around the issue of integrity we can go far okay let me bring in some of the feedback really quick because we're running out of time you're supposed to end at eight let's bring up some of the feedback real quick and then take closing remarks charlo wood rosie says before lying to people about buying land to them why don't they find the reasons as to why these people are landless in their own land the dp has been in government for so many years what has he done to resolve the land issues in kenya all right uh, Robert says, tell Dennis that there is not enough land for everyone at the coast or anywhere else. And the notion that grabbers should be rewarded by their land being purchased by taxpayers are pana. Okay. That's not what I said, Dennis. Frank Rinde says, this election will be more about reforms and status quo. Land is an emotive issue in this country, but the only reason we've never had solutions is purely corruption related where perpetrators have always had protection from above. Lemayne Charles says the land issue should not be politicized. As a country, we need to work on land ownership policies with reference to our history. As a country, government buying land will be another great corruption balloon waiting to burst. Okelo Molimu says Kenya is a country that highly values corruption. Our politicians are a replica of ourselves. That's why we rally behind people with questionable integrity credentials, frown any time they are barred from running, and insult each other on their behalf as they build empires. Okay. Conrad Kulo says, leaders with integrity enhance cooperation. For instance, firms with strong ethical oversight teams enhance their ability to attract investors, customers, and talented connoisseurs. In Kenya, we have cases where investors have been pushed away, e.g. Dangote. Okay. Atanas Mavuti says, if we vote the president and doesn't fulfill the promises, what do we do? and parliament we vote in to oversight the executive in most cases becomes the other way around where MPs dance to the song of the executive and we need a vibrant opposition. Okay. Leonard Masika says, as Kenyan electorates, we've been carefully listening to politicians get convinced about their promises. The only challenge we face is after we have elected leaders, we think they are good, they fail us on the issues of implementing the manifestos. Let God help us. Okay. Kipchumba, very brief final remarks because we run out of time here. 30 seconds, your closing remarks. My closing remarks will be, first of all, Trevor, yeah. is to thank the people of Western Gishu County. In the recent uh, concluded UDA elections, uh, they voted for me overwhelmingly as their senatorial candidate, although something happened, but I am thanking them for their votes. Getting 62,000 votes is not a mean feat, and uh, I'll be visiting each and every village to say thank you and uh, to but tell them the now. way forward. I am not running for personal reasons, but I am thankful for the vote of confidence they had in me. Yeah, okay. Dennis? Yeah, uh, Trevor, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to the show. But one of the things I have to say is that we have to medicate completely surgical pro uh, a deliverance of the moral dilemma in politics, and that is the conflict of interest. Yeah. You know, you as a, a voter, you think you've voted somebody in, that you really love them and you believe in them and they've given you all these ideas and concepts, then they are corrupted when they get in with their personal interest. Mm -hmm. That is something that we have then to strengthen our institutions that fight graft, and we have to depoliticize the criminal justice system. Okay. In conclusion, 
I am extremely excited about the economic charters that UDA is doing. Why am I saying that? Because they provide an opportunity to put Mamamboga on the table for the very first time. And the question of inclusivity has always been, you know, sort of the, the green, uh, uh, you, you know, theory in terms of equity. Okay. So that is something that needs to be clearly progressed. All right. And, 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 and it's a good progression. And I'll encourage everyone, wherever it's coming, participate. Whether you're from UDA or not, yeah. you know, all, all these are your opportunities. Okay. So I'm very excited about the validation of the economic right. challenge. I think for me is that uh, the we have experience in this country of long drawn struggles. There was the struggle for independence, all the way from Mekatilil protest in 1900 up to 63. We have had the constitutional discussion for more than 36 years. I think we need to start an implementation journey with the new constitution and the question of integrity being, you know, it's the beginning of the journey, but we take small steps and ensure that there's integrity in our people appointed, integrity in our people, in the people who seek uh, public office. Okay. And we invest as communities and people in all spaces, including ensuring that before anybody comes to ask you for votes, and if you come from a, a, a region A, yeah. they should uh, you should have a written contract with these people, which was that's the only way to check them in future. Okay. I think that that implementation from the small levels, getting people to say in my village, if you become so and so, you will do this and then you sign. And in a way that it can be justiciable, yeah. even if at the beginning it may be problematic. Okay. That is the way to ensure that we have integrity in this country. And when they don't fulfill it, yeah. you don't discuss. And those are the charters, by the way. Yeah. All right. Thank okay. you so much for making time this morning. Kawive Wambua, who's a deputy CEO in Nuka, Kenya. <laughs> Dennis Dumbi, governance and security expert. But Oliver Kipchumba, advocate of the High Court, and Franklin Mkwanja, executive director, CMD, he had to rush because he had another function to attend at 8. But most important, thank you for all the feedback that you've sent through 74 days of the elections. Like you always say, it is not about enmity, but at the end of the day, you're the one with the power, right? Make your choices and always ensure that you still love and unite with your neighbor because at the end of the day, we all we have is each other. All right? Taking a quick break. You want to come back now? It's DJ Gigi on the decks. It's Friday, people. There's always a reason to celebrate every day. See you in a bit. <laughs>